Peter R. Bregan, M.D., is called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful reform efforts. His scientific and educational work provide the foundation for modern criticism of drugs and ECT and lead the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His books include Talking Back to Prozac, Toxic Psychiatry, Medication Madness, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, and now Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. Welcome to the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour. Hello, 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 my wonderful audience. <clears throat> this is my second show from home, my home office, and I'm sitting here now looking out uh, big window I had put in the end of my office uh, overlooking the uh, the backyard and the woods and uh, snow is falling. We've got a fresh five inches of snow here in uh, Ithaca, New York, and I'm looking at a snowbird. Uh, it's literally called a snowbird. It's a junco, um, and it's just landed on uh, one of my feeders that's providing a a whole bunch of hearts of sunflower seeds, a preferred food of birds, if you're interested to know. That leaves no mess because it's just the heart of the seeds. So glad to be talking to you and relating to you on this day and doing it from my home office. I really, really like this. Puts me in a different place. Today is Wednesday at uh, 4 p.m. when I'm always on the air. For those of you who have just happened on this show and have no idea what's happening. And uh, it's live on Wednesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. in New York time, by the way, 4 to 5 uh, on PRN.FM. And today is the uh, last show of the month. So today is basically for my listeners My listeners become my guests. This is where my listeners get to call in, ask me questions, not sharing with with my guests, so my guests are really good. Today, it's just me and you. Call in and ask your questions and make comments or observations about anything you want that vaguely touches on being a human being. How's that? Anything that vaguely touches on human sciences or helping one another, uh, you know, just just anything along those lines. I want to keep broadening this. We get so focused on the drugs, and I will take all the callers, call about the drugs, but we get so focused on that. And you call in at the usual 888-874-4888. Um, you got that? I'm going to do it again now. 888-874-4888. And you can go to the archives of the show and listen to hundreds of shows on Bregan.com. Just go there and uh, take a look down the left-hand side of the opening page, and you'll see my radio show. And you can send me emails directly, and I have been reading them. Uh, many of them involve direct help. And referrals, which I am not in a position to do. Others uh, are uh, really uh, things I'm I'm very much learning from. And I will be responding occasionally by email to folks who have written in. I want to thank a guest who has sent in at my request after her wonderful question, a description of uh, what she went through with a family member. I'll be getting back to her. And um, also remember that um, on, and by the way, that email to email me is Bregan Live. I love that. Bregan Live at Hotmail.com. And uh, don't forget also our daily breaking news on the website, which contains articles uh, that relate to today's show, actually. Uh, I may or may not name them, but they do relate to today's show. We have a good article on empathy in therapy that you can find to back up things I'll be talking about today. Um, I've announced in advance, I'm going to talk briefly about love and so-called psychiatric disorders. And I will um, get to, uh, to do that now. And I'm actually meaning that I'm going to get to the callers. We already have people calling in. Thank you. Uh, for some reason, we've got two from Canada. 
Um, but I'll be getting to you in a very few minutes. Um, let me let me uh, describe to you my latest blog, and it's I think one of the most important things I've ever written. Go to my website, sign up for the frequent alerts, which is uh, one of the most important uh, things I've ever, ever written. I rarely say that. And the general theme of the blog is that the centerpiece of whether we have a good life is whether we can give and accept love. And that to the extent that we have difficulty giving and accepting love, we are not going to be happy and we are going to have numerous disorders. And that can go the whole range across psychiatry from uh, all the childhood disorders we name and, you know, schizophrenia and bipolar and depression, anxiety, it doesn't matter what. Uh, if you look beneath those fake diagnoses, they're fake because they, they mimic medical diagnoses, but, but these aren't medical problems. So if you look beneath them, you talk to people who are suffering from being depressed, or talk to people who have withdrawn from reality, or talk to people who are just routinely unhappy and, and can't quite explain why. They just have fatigue and tiredness and so on. In my experience, in most of these situations where we humans are unhappy, there's something going wrong in our ability to engage life in a loving way, an excited way, a happy way. If you look at uh, the, an infant growing up, from the very, very beginning, the determination of whether the infant is doing well is how well it's engaging with his or her mother. It's as simple as that. You know, they give you the signs of autism and they say lacking eye contact. Okay, that's, that's not a neurological disorder. It's not like the child can't move their eyes. It's a problem in the relationship with the parents, with the caregiver that needs to be overcome. It may be a good caregiver, but something's off. Maybe a good mom, good dad was ever primary, but something is off. In fact, if we could catch those things really, really early, I, I think we could, we could heal them, but we never catch them really, really early. The, or rarely, anyway. So it could even be PTSD. Would you think, well, no, no, that's due to a trauma that just happens to the person. But actually, that's not so, because if a person goes through a dreadful hurricane, uh, they say they're holed up in a tiny house on, on the shore. And they really wonder whether they're going to live or die. Uh, and, but they've got their family with them and they've made the preparations they needed to do. And they took a, a risk that they thought through and they go through this bad event and they all come through it together. And they, and they come through more close knit than before. They're, they're not going to have what, what we call this PTSD. No, they're not. They'll, they'll actually have a positive experience to build on in their lives. All of the things we call psychiatric disorders, or nearly all of them, depending on how absolute I want to be about it on a given day, come down to disruptions in our engagement with life. We no longer have the zest of the child who loves being with his parents and also wants to explore and engage with life and nature and dogs and cats and so on and so forth. Something's gone wrong there. And so all the good therapies <clears throat> begin with helping people learn to love. All of them begin with helping people learn to love. So keep that in mind. Read my blog. I'm going to be talking more and more about this. Now, as I go back in my life, I've been talking about this since I was a college volunteer running the Harvard Radical Mental Hospitals volunteer program and going to conferences as a college freshman and sophomore and explaining our program and talking about how I thought that what the patients really needed was care and was love. I really was doing that. And I tried to write about it, but the final books that came out were monitored by psychiatrists 
And so the first book I co-authored on that, uh, they pretty much took out the word love. So that, that's how it goes in our field. But human engagement is the key to life and helping people grow involves helping them re-engage with life. And if you can engage with a, uh, with a person who is uh, having a really, really horrible hallucinations, delusions, you, you're not going to make them all better in a session or in even several sessions. And they, they may have a period of, long period of recovery. They may still have alternative realities at times. But if you can provide them a loving reality as a, a therapist who understands ethics, doesn't take any advantage of the patient, always maintains a certain professional demeanor while relating in a loving way and talking about the importance of love. You will, even on the first session, at times see all those hallucinations and delusions fade away as the person begins to trust you and to engage with you in a caring way. So that's my message for November 28th, 2018. And I hope I'll have a chance to pick up on it with some of the numerous people who have all called in. I want to thank you for calling in. And, and one thing I also want to observe, one of the folks who wrote in to me on Bregan Live um, at Hotmail.com said they'd like to hear more from professionals, not so much less from non-professionals, but more from people in the field, working in the field with some of their thoughts and observations. So and I wonder if some of you feel shy, like you don't want to uh, interfere with the many calls we get from people who are uh, non-professionals and dealing with, with these issues, uh, such difficult issues. So I do, I welcome, I want it, you know that, I welcome professionals, non-professionals, I welcome people who don't know whether they're professional or not, non-professional. Um, well, let, let's uh, go ahead and um, Alex, who handles these calls so wonderfully, um, let's take our first caller, Daniel from Montreal. Daniel, are Hi. you there? Yes, I am. God, is that a miracle? I don't know how Alex does this. Um, <laughs> hi, Daniel. You, you sent a note that you love the subject. Were you talking about the subject that I had said I'd be starting the show with? Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, let me hear uh, from you. Pardon? Yes. So, so uh, tell me, tell us uh, and the listeners uh, why you called in. Uh, why I called in <clears throat> is because I I really appreciate the work you've done, the books you've published, uh, the approach you've taken. Um, when I see a traditional institutional psychiatry produce so much hurt and harm in so many people, it's it's quite uh, disheartening. It is very disheartening. Um, you know, love gets trained out of you, uh, often as a physician and almost always as a psychiatrist, because, I mean, uh, one of the rituals you have to go through as a young psychiatrist is you have to give shock treatment. And if you're going to do that and then see your patient the next day, as you do when you're a resident usually and you're giving shock, uh, and, and you see what you've done to them, you have to begin to inure yourself. You have to harden yourself to what you're doing. And I think that that all the way we relate to patients on our war, hospital wards, uh, requires of us to not have caring relationships with them. Yes, um, and, a, and a proper, uh, if I could just jump in for a moment, the proper antidote to um, electric shock therapy, for example, is the book by a neurologist, uh, Dr. Sterling, who was in the position you just described and wrote a book about shock therapy not being good for your brain. So that's a good antidote. Yes. Now, that was not Dr. Sterling. That was John Friedberg. Oh, sorry. No, He's, that's good. I'll, I'll right. explain the yes. difference. John Friedberg, who, who uh, is somebody I knew very well. He's not with us anymore. And that's right. He, he was... This, a neurologist, and he wrote that very good book, uh, Electroshock Shock is Not Good for Your Health. He told me that, um, or your brain, he told me that he, he figured that if nobody even ever read the book, at least they'd see that title somewhere <laughs> and he'd get his message across. But there is a fellow named Sterling who is an anatomist, not an MD, 
who has huh. written some very good things about harm from uh, psychiatric treatments. Uh, I haven't heard from him in a while. Uh -huh. uh, Okay, yeah, he may have been part of that uh, panel discussion some years ago when there was an attempt in New York State to ban ECT. Uh, I know it was banned temporarily in Berkeley, California, but it may have come back since. Oh, it came back quite soon afterward. There was quite a yeah. shoot and cry from the squealing professionals. <laughs> <laughs> but Sterling certainly might have been a part of that, and I was a part of that, Uh no, wait a minute. No, I was a part of uh, the attempt to do the same thing in San Francisco. I was not involved with Berkeley. Um, uh, boy, that's going back to the 1970s. I don't know if you realize how far back you're going. Yes, there. yes, I realize that. <laughs> yes, it. Uh, well, I'm going to be 70 years old at the end of next month, so um, I was at the uh, Philadelphia conference in 1978, uh, which uh, was um, uh, a symposium of uh, former, um, I, I call them survivors. Um, um, the head of Mind Freedom was there, uh, David Oakes. Uh, I sure. Him there. Yeah. He, David's still working. Still yeah, doing David's his still stuff. working, although unfortunately he had a bit of a mishap, and so he's not mm -hmm. uh, as able as he was. Right. Is there anything about love that you wanted to comment on, Daniel? Uh, the, uh, <laughs> when I hear the word love, I just think poetry. I think uh, I think beautiful women. Um, that's about all I can think about verbally. Uh, to me, love. Oh, is uh, whoa, wait, wait, wait. What about birds? I just saw a a uh, red-bellied woodpecker land on one of my feeders. What about uh, pets and dogs and best yes. friends and yes. God yes. and nature? Yes. So Absolutely. I think if you weren't on the air, you know, uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, struck by being on air, you'd think of a lot of other things with the word love. Yes, exactly. One of my favorite um, channels on my television is called Nature Sounds, and uh, I hear bird calls, and that's my default position for the television. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, thank you. I didn't know about that. Well, Daniel, thank you for calling in. You're welcome. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we have uh, another call from Canada. And, pardon me, <clears throat> we have another call from Canada. And uh, uh, it's Jane, call number five on the numbering system. Um, and uh, Alex, connect me with Jane. Are you there? I am. Thank and, you. And you, you wrote something about spiritual. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd go to you because it's right on our topic. Well, um, I'm, a, I'm a natural health practitioner. I am not a doctor. <clears throat> um, and um, but I do have an interest in work with um, emotional health, not uh, not complex issues. And um, and I'll just uh, I first uh, um, was drawn to your work, and I'm so appreciative of of what you're bringing out and the work you're doing is huge because I have a six year old grandson who was our he's seven now um, was put on Vyvanse as soon as he hit grade one, and. Um, so where I'm going with this, I don't want to take up too much time, but there are other issues like EMF and mold, um, and there's a lot of, you know, science now showing how we can have sleep disorders and um, hyperactivity and things. So when what, I what is what's the EMS? The uh, it's electromagnetic fields that are unhealthy. I'm speaking about Wi-Fi, cell phone use, and things, and I'm relating it to people who have trouble sleeping when they have uh, a lot of um, EMF. <clears throat> My question, though, is, is, and I didn't know, I came in a little late, so I wasn't quite sure about the subject, but I think it'll tie in with um, love. So one of the things is that I do a lot of research. Um, I like to go to the actual source. So whether the source is a doctor of, of like yourself who has years of experience in psychiatry and, uh, and mental and emotional health, um, rebalancing or whether it's um, a former CIA or former secret agent or a former or a scientist or a CDC uh, researcher who you know um, came across research information and 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 so I try and actually go to people who actually have experience and the knowledge so that it can be really clear so I don't use TV media or mainstream media 
or stories in magazines and things, and I stay away from that. But what I'm just finding is that there are certain... It seemed to come across, of course, more triggered during the election. So without getting political, I have found that whether it's um, usually family or friends, and I won't go into clients because clients tend to just, you know, let, allow them to, to guide me. But what I'm finding is that there's a bigger gap that seems to be ripping relationships apart. And I'm recognizing it, but I'm finding that um, I'm exploring to learn more about what is termed spiritual bypassing. And um, it's, I don't believe it's exactly the same, but cognitive dissonance. And I am, I am, I do meditate. I am in um, groups. And what I find let, let me interrupt that, a second now. Yeah, the concept <clears throat> is cognitive dissonance. And what cognitive dissonance is, is the stress and difficulty people have when they have two conflicting ideas <clears throat> that don't make sense together. I don't know. <clears throat> Excuse me again. I have no idea why my throat is in rebellion right now. But uh, I don't know about spiritual bypassing. Um, I think there may be a number of things that I'm not sure about that you're kind of alluding to. But could you just briefly define spiritual bypassing? Because that seemed to be why you were calling in. I have no idea what it is. Um, I've never heard the term. Um, uh, I'd Google it, it, but I'd probably lose my radio show in the process. So can no, you tell us what that is? Um, it, you know, I don't know if it's an, an invented or if it's a broad term or, or what, but when I first heard it, it's it's not about religion, but it's about people who, and I was raised this way in that uh, our thoughts are really powerful and so are our feelings. And so um, we're not allowed, pe spiritual bypassing is, is a belief that you always have to be the Pollyanna. You always have to be really positive. And oh, okay. So you're bypassing so your actual inner complexities and things like that? Or your, your, your legitimate anger or something like that? Um, if there is something that, for example, a subject, let's say, like pedophilia. I mean, a subject that's really, um, or uh, human trafficking or something that someone finds out that there's much more deeper to the story or there's something that they're discovering. Um, transgender is one. And, um, for example, it's not about, I'm not talking about people who love the, and I'm, this is where the love comes in, love the same sex, um, can have a 25-year relationship, um, is filled with empathy and compassion, and is a, a huge uh, um, contributor to society, has a successful business, is successful with family and with friends, and, and has a full balanced life versus the transgender that um, they're bringing in for under, you know, young children. I'm having trouble fo following you. Um, it might be me, but when I'm I, having trouble. You just described a uh, rich and I, happy gay relationship. Uh, certainly that exists, but I, I, what has this got to do with spiritual bypassing? I'm confused, Jane. Well, spiritual bypassing is sometimes there's subjects that seem to come up um, for conversation only. It's not about, it's not a debate, it's not right or wrong, just for conversation. And, and um, often the conversation around it, if it is um, a negative of some sort, then... Um, well, people like certainly, so certainly so shy so away from thinking about painful things, new things, unusual things. At least many, many people do shy away from that. Jane, if you want to, uh, you know, send me an email at um, breganlive at hotmail.com and refer me to uh, the spiritual bypassing. I'll be grateful. Um, I want to go on now and talk some about uh, some more about love. I want to get back to that and then I'll take a couple of calls on uh, the psychiatric medications. Um, the my definition of love is joyful awareness. And I like to broaden it and say engaging with some aspect of life in a joyful way. <clears throat> 
And to help somebody recover from almost any kind of experience they're going through, including outright trauma or or knowing they have cancer, I mean, or just learning they do or great loss. If you can reconnect them to some aspect of joyful engagement that they have had in their lives, you can help. And if you are dealing with a person who is very unhappy and has been forever unhappy in their relationships, approach them with the question of what is love. I mean, I might do that fairly early on, maybe the first hour, and define it and ask them if they've ever had a relationship that was a joyful engagement with another person. And they may say no, and I might ask them about a pet or anything. Sometimes it might be a tree in childhood, believe it or not, or a pet is quite common in childhood. And if you can build on that with someone or with yourself, if you're struggling with this yourself as you're listening, you can build with them on this whole idea of refinding or finding for the first time a, a joyful engagement with some aspect of life, then you begin their recovery, if you want to call it. Actually, what you begin is their re-engagement with life in a loving way. Well, I've got a couple of people who have been very uh, patient, and uh, let's let's go to them uh, in Canada. Effie in Canada. Hi. Are you there? Uh, yes, I am, doctor. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon to you, too. You sound bright and engaged. Well, we have a sunny day up here in Calgary, Canada, so I guess we can't complain with a few inches of snow. So that's great. <laughs> it sounds that sounds beautiful. We have a dreary day here in Syracuse with about Syracuse. Syracuse is nearby in Ithaca uh, uh, with about five inches of snow and a light falling snow. So well, what do you have on, on your mind, Effie? To the New York area, 1981, on a cruise. So it's uh, mm-hmm. all out there. So tell me why you're calling. Okay, the reason I'm calling, this could go on long, but I'll really keep it short. It's uh, about my 32-year-old daughter. Uh, She's on an old uh, antipsychotic called Fluenxol. Are you aware of that drug? It's uh, injectable. I think uh, it also goes by Flupentifol. Okay, yes, I know what that is. I know okay. what you're talking and about. She's been on it since 2015. Yeah, we don't we don't have that in the USA. Pardon me. We don't have that drug in the USA. That's a Canadian no, no. British I, she's drug. The only one that my daughter would go on because she's been on everything and she'd either spit it out or whatever. It's been going on since 2010. Uh, so, anyways, last year, uh, anyways, I decided finally I had enough three years ago and said, "That's it, you guys." You listen to me, I've read psychiatric drug referral, brain disabling elements, uh, medication madness, uh, everything I could get a hold of, and really educated myself. And so now they're a little bit more listening to me, but anyways, uh, we tried to withdraw from it uh, last year, coming down very slowly, but what, because she started at 50 milligrams, and once we got down to 25 milligrams, then it you know, her voices in her head would come and bug her and this and that. And finally, when even when we got to 15 milligrams, that was it. They had to hospitalize her. Anyways, they got her back up to 50 uh, last uh, last year. We moved out of that city, came here, and she started on 50 milligrams last January. And now we're going to 325 what, what is the question you're moving toward? I, I don't need all these details. I'm okay. not, I can't make a medical analysis on the sure. air. What, what are you getting at? I'm trying to getting at it. Is it impossible to come off the depot, the Fluenxol, in time? Um, yes. Well, it's very hard to come off depot drugs mm-hmm. because you can't really taper them very well. I see. So um, I've never even tried, I don't think, to take somebody off a depot drug. Um, How often are her shots? 
uh, every two weeks. And she's starting, they're, they've just reduced it from 35 milligrams every two weeks to 32.5 every two weeks. I, I think you have a better shot at withdrawing her if you were, had her on pills. I brought before, that question hmm? to the doctor. He said it's impossible. What is your take on that? What's impossible? To, to withdraw to somebody? Off, uh, medic, off the depot and put her on pills. No, that's not impossible. There are formulas for it. In fact, in the in in the U.S., if you get the, the FDA information or just Google Google uh, formula for uh, um, transitioning from the drug to uh, to pills, and you'll probably find something googling it. Okay. Um, but it, it's very very hard because you can't just titrate. For example. If I'm taking somebody off an equivalent drug like that in the U.S. Um, and they start to get a little strange as we come off, they get more into the alternative reality or they get more, um, it's not really strange, more into the, I take back that word and wash my mouth out with soap. But as a person gets more into an alternative reality or more right. anxious or scared or frightened or sleepless, all we have to do during a withdrawal practice is, uh, a, a protocol is go back to the late previous dose that day. That day. So, you have to do it so, right away then. Yeah, yeah. So you might then, because if you go back that day, then the person may go back to where they were. That is typically, almost always, if you're withdrawing mm -hmm. on pills. Right. When yeah. you, or fluids, anything oral. And the person just calls me on the phone and says, oh, Doc, I'm having a terrible time today. And and we we had just reduced the drug a few days earlier. I just say, go well, go back on the previous dose. You'll probably feel better right away or within an hour, depending on how much food you have in your stomach. And yeah. then we'll wait and see when you're comfortable and when you want to resume reducing. So you yeah. can't do the single most important aspect Wow, one of the one of the most important aspects of withdrawal when you're doing uh, um, that that process of giving a drug that stays in the system for um, for two two weeks because there's no no way to adjust it on a daily basis during withdrawal. So I hope that answers your question. And um, I don't even know without looking whether that drug comes in pill form, but I do believe it probably does. And if not, there are other drugs that can replace it. And there are formulas for that that you can get. And I, of course, I wouldn't have those in my head. Uh, but you can Google them and get reputable um, sources or get a handbook of pharmacology. Am I answering, um, am I answering your question? It, it seems easy if you just have to get the doctors to, to the psychiatrists to believe that because they don't. So you're in a loop, I guess. Well, that's right. And I don't know an easy way out. In this country, we can pick other psychiatrists. Um, if you're stuck in a clinic, it's harder. Um, in this country, we can go to a general practitioner and sometimes they'll, they'll do the prescribing and help the withdrawal take place. But perhaps if you got your, your psychiatrist my book, of course, that might make them mad, but maybe it would help them understand how to go about it. Um, so that's about what I can do for you, Effie. And uh, thank you for the very, very important call. It's given me a chance to explain something very important to you. And um, maybe you could explain it to the psychiatrist or the nurse or, or, or somebody else like that. I wish you the best, Effie. Uh, Anna, in uh, New Mexico, you had a medication question. And oh, folks, we will have a room for more callers, 888-874-4888, Anna in New Mexico, hello. Hi, how are you, doctor? I'm good. I'm good. I enjoy getting on the air, and now that I'm taking more and more callers and doing this once a week where all I do is take callers... I'm just getting looser and more relaxed on my show. Um, and it's kind of nice to, to know that um, getting older, I can get more relaxed rather than more uptight. <laughs> how, exactly. Tell me how you're doing. 
All of us, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I'm calling about a 49-year-old woman uh, who was put on um, a, a cocktail of Prozac, Seroquel, and I don't know the third uh, entity, but um, and she's been on them for 30 or 40 years. And um, when I had said about how about trying hugs, not drugs, and she said, well, um, when I run out of those uh, prescriptions and I don't fill them for a few days, I feel the difference. And so um, um, my question to you is, uh, will would she be able to get off those drugs and then would her brain return to making uh, the necessary neurotransmitters or whatever chemicals that those drugs are allegedly making to, um, you know, to, to get her off this cycle of these uh, uh, medication madness, to quote, you, you know, your book yes. title. Well, um, first... Um I can't, of course, address her as an individual patient in her circumstance, so that I'm sure you realize that. Yes. But I'll talk broadly, um, as I did with the previous caller, because it's addressing uh, the very same issue. And you remember I described how, uh, were you able to hear the show a few minutes ago when we yes. had a phone, another phone call, a phone call yes. from Canada? Yes. Good. Okay, well... And I, I described how when a patient uh, is going through withdrawal and just a small degree of change in a drug can put them in withdrawal. So what your friend is experiencing, um, is that a family member or a friend, Anna? A uh, family. Yeah. Well, what your family member is experiencing is withdrawal. So if people can experience withdrawal just from a fraction of a Reduction. Imagine what kind of withdrawal somebody's going to go through if they stop a drug completely. Mm. Cold turkey. It should never, ever, ever be done when you've been on it for a few weeks or months. And your family member's been on for years. So um, a drug withdrawal for her uh, could last years, actually, if she's been on it so many years. But the basic principles are in my book, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. I, I would just hope you, you, would, um, you would get it and, um, and read about it, what the withdrawal process is. And it's uh, very slow with somebody in her situation. And you usually choose a drug that you think you might have an easier time withdrawing from. And I, I can't get into that on the air. Uh, but the book talks all about it in detail. Now, you tend to withdraw one drug at a time. Maybe then you switch to another drug. But you have to read about the principles and hopefully find a clinician who would work with you and your family member. If you're involved in her life very much, it would be great if you were going with her to her prescriber mm. and giving her the support there and talking with the prescriber because being on, on, on multiple drugs for uh, what begins to look like a lifetime is not good for the brain, but coming off after so many years on it is very, very slow. And in my experience, people's lives do improve. I can't say whether she will recover completely from the drugs. I have no way of saying that. Mm. But, but generally, people improve a lot coming off psychiatric drugs but after such a long period of time, it's gradual, and she should have a good therapist, and hopefully a therapist who would work with family members, because people need a huge amount of support coming off the drugs. Do, do you have any other uh, question about this? Oh, yes, thanks. Uh, I'm related that um, uh, Gary Knoll, in uh, his uh, book, Get Healthy Now, uh, alleges that um, both tranquilizers and SSRIs um, have uh, heavy metals in them. Is that uh, true? I don't know a lot about that issue, Anna. How's that for an admission from a world-class expert? I have, okay. I have not looked into that. 
I, mm. My impression is that pretty much all the, most of the psychiatric drugs have fluoride in them. Oh. Uh, so that he may be talking about that. The, the fluorine molecule enables the drugs to cross the blood-brain barrier. So oh. a lot of the drugs have that. So I guess I know a little bit about it. But mm. I'm, I don't know what contribution the fluoride is making to the long-term harm. Mm. I'm more familiar with the long-term harm of what they're doing to the neurotransmitter systems. Uh. Uh, Do you have anything else? You're, you've been thinking a lot about stuff. Yeah. I, I generally then, um, do amino acids uh, taken in a therapeutic mode, that is, uh, on an empty stomach, um, and letting them uh, seep into the... <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> think so. Um, I think what works is, uh, and I, if you uh, go to my website, Bregan.com and look down the left side, you'll see the radio show and you click on that and, and look up Popper, P-O-P-P-E-R, my guest Pam Popper and my dear friend Pam Popper. And she is a, uh, um, a nutritionist who helps people get on to whole foods uh-huh. like, like, um, uh, potatoes and uh, rice and whole grains and unprocessed foods and to reduce meat a great deal and to stop all dairy. That's basically the healthiest diet there is. It's you, you do the whole foods as much as possible, vegetables, whole foods. You could do a little meat if you want and you can do uh, no dairy at all. And it's changed my life. I no long. I was taking asthma medicines until I started that diet a, a year ago, about a year and a half ago now. And I also had, um, in addition to uh, the asthma, I had hypertension. And I just assumed these were what I was going to be plagued with in my over 80 years. And uh, that's gone. I no longer take blood pressure medicines. And I lost uh, 30, 30 pounds and... Uh, I've been holding right. pretty steady on that. Mm-hmm. My wife uh, went on the diet and got over a decades of ulcerative colitis. And the books to read about this would be Pam Popper's book, which uh, one of her books, um, which is Food is Medicine. Uh, Google Pam Popper. I do an annual conference with her. It was this past November and it'll be next November. And also look up... Um, the uh, the tradition, the scientific basis, which is the China study. If you're a good reader and you want a big, heavy book at the second edition of the China study by Campbell, you could also get uh, his son's book uh, called um, Whole, W-H-O-L-E, Campbell. He has an MD. His father is a PhD. And he, he talks about the basis for the whole food diet. So there are some good researches for you. And there's a wonderful video. It's old, but it's a wonderful video called Forks Over Knives. Um, so uh, there's a lot of really good stuff Thank that, you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, that you could turn to. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks for calling in, Anna. Um, well, hi, folks. It's, it's you and me. I don't know if a host is supposed to say this, but I don't, I don't have a caller on. If, if we got one more caller, it, it, we could handle that. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is relax and talk some more about this issue of love. Because as I'm talking about it, I'm thinking more about it. I think it could be really interesting for you uh, in the most important ways. Many people, when they think of love, they think of pain and suffering. Um that's, oh, you know what? Well, I'll finish this statement, then we'll go to somebody who has, uh, uh, oh, I'm getting calls, and oh, bang, 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 I'm getting calls in response to my request for them. So let me just finish this thought. You know, when we think about love, we think about pain and suffering, because most of us have been in love, at least been very excited about somebody and very infatuated with them of the same sex or the opposite sex. And, and we've lost 
we've either rejected them or been rejected or something happened to them. And it's the suffering that we confuse with love. Because if you think back to love itself, it's happy. It always just makes us think the whole world's tra changed and transformed for the better. Unless we get very frightened at the very start, in which case uh, we might indeed uh, um, uh, drop the love relationship because it's so scary. But love itself is wonderful if it doesn't have an element, a central element of joy, joyful engagement. It's something other than love. It's desperate need, anger. We can get attached in, in multiple ways. But you, when you think about whether you ever love somebody, think about and whether you love the person you're with, think about the joyful engagement uh, that you feel. And, uh, and you'll be on the right track in evaluating what this is about. And a lot of the, the misery in life, certainly for me, a lot of the misery in my early life was that I was hurt uh, twice in, in love, love relationships when I was very young, 14 and 19. And I, I just sort of let go of it. I really did. And it was not good until Ginger came into my life. Uh, that's too complicated and personal story for the radio probably, but maybe someday. Um, so, uh, good, good. Phil, in uh, Michigan, you want to talk about love theory? Yes. Hi, Dr. Bragan. I agree with everything you've said, and I can't wait to continue reading your blog. I encourage you to write a lot about this subject. <laughs> I, I can't you. tell you how Thank enthusiastic God. I am. I've had over 25 years experience as a clinician in private practice. I'm a clinical social worker graduate of the University of Michigan, which is the number one social work school in the country. I'm not trying, I'm not a plug for the University of Michigan, but I'm just saying I got excellent education. And I've been a clinician for over 25 years, and I just want to make two points and say that in working with hundreds of clients and living in this world as a human being on my own, I will say that love is the only answer. And I say that emphatically. I may be one of your biggest and best fans, but I know from the bottom of my soul that what you're saying is absolutely true. And I'm shocked that there aren't a whole bunch of people on that bandwagon. It seems to be very sparse. And I know that my love of animals, my pets, my dogs, my cats through the years have gotten me through for sanity, for joy, for happiness, for health. And I let my clients bring their animals to the sessions. And you should see the difference in how happy they became, how focused they be, their their stories became and how they healed and so I know that what you're talking about is absolutely true it was true for hundreds of my clients it's true for me personally as a human being as a professional as uh, someone in this world that is so strident right now we can hardly listen to the news so I hope that what you'll write about and talk about will be more, 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 more. And number two, I want to share a personal private list. It's not so private, it, but it's my personal list of like about five people that support what you're saying who also have credentials, have written books, and are um, leaders in the field of doing away with psychiatric medications, which as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I, I can't prescribe, nor do I. I am totally against all of that. I've seen people kill themselves over that. My personal best friend, Mike, took his life two years ago because he was on four medications that were contraindicated. There's a lawsuit there, but his parents don't want to pursue it. So I have to let that go. I'm not related to him. 
so I have to let that go. But it kills me because I know that the medications brought him down and they influenced his brain and they caused him to take his life. So I'm very adamant about that. Now, getting back to my list, I'm going to give you and the listeners, this is gold. This is really good. This gets me through life. Dr. Kelly Brogan, she's a psychiatrist in New York City. I know Kelly Gabor, pretty well. Yeah, Ke- Kelly Brogan is excellent. And she will support you, me, anybody that is against medication and is for joy and is for love and is for connection. We only live a little bit in our lives. It's a flash in the pan when you think of eternity. So we're only here for a very, very, very short while. Why not live it in joy and love? Surround yourself with what makes you happy. Forget the medications. The second person is Gabor Mater. Gabor Matra, M-A-T-E. He is a trauma expert. He doesn't even believe in ADD. Spell, and, spell his um, last name again. Gabor, G-A-B-O-R, no, the, yep. Matra, Matra, M-A-T-E. Okay. By the way, there's he an echo. He, I wonder why that, uh, there's an echo. Maybe, maybe uh, you're listening to the show at the same time. I'm not sure. Go ahead. Down. Okay, Gabor Matra, M-A-T-E. He is, t- he, okay, he's another one. He's a, a physician. Um, the next one is Charles Eisenstein. He's a graduate of Yale and he's a very intelligent person. He's totally against medication, too. The next one is someone... Is he a physician? What is uh, his background? Charles Eisenstein, no. He's a writer. He's a writer. I don't know him. I don't think. Maybe I do, but I don't remember knowing him. Okay, who else? I think this is interesting to have other people brought in at this time. Go ahead. Who else? Marianne Williamson wrote... Uh, a cor- well, she talks all about the Course in Miracles. So her uh, thesis is peppered with some spirituality. She's not religious, but anyway, that's important too. The next one is Thomas More. He wrote Care of the Soul. If you lose your soul, you've lost your connection to love. Thomas More is in his <clears throat> 70s. He lives in New England, and he's excellent. And the next one is Robert Whitaker, who you yeah, know. By, by the way, through- Tom Moore, in his book, has, has mentioned my work. I'm not sure that we've met. And now you're, <clears throat> you're mentioning Robert Whitaker, who's a, a fr- good friend and runs the uh, MIA, the um, big website uh, that has got, got more information on it than any website in the world, I guess, about all the... Uh, different kinds of uh, approaches to psychiatric uh, reform. It's www.mad in America. Um, but uh, go ahead. And he's written um, Anatomy of an Epidemic. Really good book. And, and you might, um, since you're interested um, in his uh, work, Phil, you could um, uh, listen to his shows. If you go onto my website, uh, the radio and and uh, go to the archive. Yes, I he's, do. Oh, I'm, I'm registered. I'm, I'm registered to listen. I get all his information, and I listen to his shows. My point no, I'm saying is, you can hear him on my radio show. He's been on four oh, or yes. five times. Yes, yes, he's wonderful. He's wonderful. I wanted to share those six people with you and your listeners because we don't have a lot of support for what you're saying, for this love theory. And as far as I'm concerned, I have almost 30 years experience, hands-on. I'm in the front lines. I'm talking to people one-on-one. And I know that my experience as professional for all those years and my experience as a human being in life, the only way we really heal 
is by love, is through love, and is with love, and is joyful awareness. That's it. And why more doctors, um, excuse the pun, swallow the pill of getting hardened and um, being, you know, stubborn and being so focused on prescribing medication and ECT, that's horrible. Why they do that, I have no idea. That's another book that I'll leave to you or somebody else to write. But Th- why they you. do that, I have no idea. Thank you, Phil. Um, we're getting toward the end of the show, and that's a very good call and uh, good information. I'm glad to move into some of the more academic and and uh, sort of uh, you know take care of those things. Now, I lost my last-minute listener who was online, uh, but maybe you're still listening. Uh, I imagine he or she thought we'd never get to to them. And um, the question was about oregano um, a, as a medicinal. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of discussion about oregano for um, especially kind of allergic reactions and things on the skin and respiratory problems. <clears throat> and I don't know a lot in particular about it. I haven't read the research on it. But in general... You want to be eating whole foods, and it's, I would think it was great to use oregano as as a spice, but don't give abnormally large amounts of any kind of vitamin or supplement to yourself. Get used to eating the right foods. There's no way around eating the right foods because your big anti-inflammatory agents are vegetables. Vegetables are the anti-inflammatory agents. And the inflammatory agents are the meats and even fish, and dairy is a particularly, particularly common one. So let me, uh, as we close down, remind you that, um, you know, engage life. What is it you really want to do? How do you really want to be? Where do you really want to go? And uh, take a look at my book, Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, because the last third of it is all about that. The beginning is how to recognize and get rid of negative emotions, guilt, shame, anxiety, anger, numbing. And and then it leads into how do you live a loving life? How do we do it, folks? And it can be done. And we'll be talking more and more about this. Thanks for being there, my really wonderful, wonderful wonderful audience and thank you for all the callers.